Hello and welcome to the video of the anatomy of salivation. I'm Tanya Chamberlain from the Division of Anatomy here at the University of Leeds and today we're going to be looking at some of the anatomical aspects of salivation, focusing on the major salivary glands and their innervation. So why are we focusing on the anatomy of salivation? Well, salivation can give us a key indication of a person's health and in some illnesses the production of salivation can be affected. Saliva helps to lubricate food for swallowing. It begins the process of chemical digestion. It acts to provide an antimicrobial mouthwash for the mouth, preventing tooth decay and rebalancing the pH of the oral cavity. And it acts to increase our ability to taste, preventing us from ingesting poisonous food or making food delicious and encouraging us to eat. There are three salivary glands on each side of the head. The parotid is located just in front of the ear, wrapped around the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible. It has a single duct that runs superficial to the masseter before turning medially to pierce the muscle of the cheek, the buccinator. It opens into the vestibule of the mouth opposite the crown of the upper second molar. The submandibular gland is a horseshoe shaped gland that has intraoral and extraoral parts. The extraoral part can be felt or palpated just below the lateral aspect of the body of the mandible. The intraoral part is located under or inferior to the mucosa of the floor of the mouth. The gland has a single duct that opens at the sublingual papilla. The papilla is located on the floor of the mouth just behind the lower incisor. There are left and right papillae, which receive ducts of the right and left submandibular glands. The sublingual glands are the smallest of the three main salivary glands, located between the tongue and the mandible. They open as a series of ductures that run along the sublingual fold. There are also many tiny salivary glands in the mucosa of the tongue, palate and lips. These are the minor salivary glands, but we're not going to look at these anymore today. We've met some of the cranial nerves before, but I think it is worth pausing for a minute or two to make sure we understand what they are. Cranial nerves all emerge from the brain and leave the skull through specific foramina. In contrast, spinal nerves emerge from the spinal cord and leave through the spaces between the vertebrae of the spinal column. There are 12 cranial nerves on each side of the body. Some just carry sensory fibres, whilst others just carry motor fibres. However, most cranial nerves carry a mixture of sensory and motor fibres. The cranial nerves are numbers used in Roman numerals 1 through 12. Nerve 1, the olfactory nerve, emerges from the brain most superiorly. The nerves emerge progressively more inferiorly until we reach number 12, the hypoglossal nerve, which emerges most inferiorly of all of them. Most of the cranial nerves have named branches. In some cases there are a lot of branches, for example, with the trigeminal nerve. Today we are looking at nerves that cause the major salivary glands to secrete. The nerve fibres stimulating secretion are called secretomotor fibres. The one supplying the salivary glands runs in nerve 7, which is the facial nerve, and in nerve 9, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. The nerve fibres that cause the salivary glands to secrete are all part of the parasympathetic nervous system, which itself is part of the autonomic nervous system, the part of the nervous system that controls the functions we don't have voluntary control over. The parasympathetic nerve fibres are associated with rest and digest functions, so it makes sense that they innervate the salivary glands. Nerves that carry autonomic nerve fibres have swellings called ganglia on them. Autonomic ganglia are found where autonomic nerve fibres join other autonomic nerve fibres. The fibres coming into the ganglion are called 
preganglionic fibres. And they stop in the ganglion by making functional connections or synapses with the cell bodies of nerve fibres that leave the ganglion, which are called the postganglionic fibres. The ganglion is present because it has to accommodate all the cell bodies of the postganglionic fibres. Cell bodies are much thicker than nerve fibres that they come from, so they take up a lot of space. When they are clustered together in one place, they form a ganglion. The postganglionic fibres then leave the autonomic ganglion and travel to the gland, in this case of salivation, that they are going to stimulate. The secretomotor fibres travelling to the salivary gland often hitch a lift in the branches of the trigeminal nerve in order to reach their destination. Note that there is another kind of ganglion as well as the autonomic kind. The other kind of ganglion also contains cell bodies but there are no synapses present. These are the sensory ganglia. An excellent example of a sensory ganglion is the trigeminal ganglion. This contains all of the cell bodies of the vast number of sensory nerve fibres carried in the trigeminal nerve and in its branches. Let's go and have a look at the learning objectives for today's video. By the end of this video and after any further necessary cell study, you should be able to describe the locations and anatomical relations of the salivary glands. Describe the routes that the ducts of the major salivary glands and identify where these ducts open into the mouth. You should be able to give an account of the secretomotor nerve that supplies the major salivary glands and outline any minor salivary glands. We've already covered two of these, so let's move on and look at the major salivary glands and their secretomotor nerve supply. We have already seen that the parotid gland is located in the posterior aspect of the face, just anterior to the ear. You can't tell from this diagram, but the gland wraps around the posterior surface of the mandibles ramus, so it lies both deep and superficial to it. The parotid gland runs anteriorly across the masseter muscle before turning medially to pierce the buccinator muscle and enter the vestibule of the mouth. The parotid gland receives its secretor motor innervation from the ninth cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve. This slide shows a simplified version of the secretor motor pathway. The diagram shows two nerve fibres running parallel along the pathway, but in reality there are many more. The glossopharyngeal arises from the brain. It is a cranial nerve after all and it leaves the cranial cavity through a small hole in the base of the skull called the jugular foramen. Just after doing so, it gives off a branch, the tympanic nerve, which goes back into the skull. While travelling through the bone, the tympanic passes through the middle ear cavity, which is found inside the temporal bone of the skull. Inside the middle ear cavity, the tympanic nerve temporarily breaks up into a network of nerve fibres located in the medial wall of the cavity. This is called the tympanic plexus. The nerve fibres then come back together to form a single nerve. This is called the lesser petrosal nerve. The lesser petrosal nerve, which is still carrying preganglionic fibres, leaves the temporal bone to enter the cranial cavity. It then runs under the brain for a short distance before turning downwards and leaving the skull through an oval shaped hole called the foramen ovale. This foramen also transmits the mandibular nerve. Just after leaving the skull, the lesser petrosal nerve enters the otic ganglion. This is an autonomic ganglion. This is where the preganglionic fibres it contains end by making synapses with the cell bodies of the postganglionic fibres. The postganglionic fibres have now got to get to the parotid gland. They do this by joining a branch of the mandibular nerve 
called the auriculotemporal nerve. The auriculotemporal nerve carries the postgonglionic fibres to the parotid gland. The preganglionic and postganglionic fibres supplying the parotid gland are all fibres of the glossopharyngeal nerve, that is cranial nerve number 9. The fact that the postganglionic fibres hitch a lift with the auriculotemporal nerve doesn't alter this. The secretomotor supplied to the parotid gland is the glossopharyngeal nerve, not the auriculotemporal and not the mandibular nerve and not the trigeminal nerve. You do not need to know all of the nerves mentioned here, but what you do need to remember is that the preganglionic fibres for the parotid hitch a ride with the glossopharyngeal, whilst the postganglionic fibres hitch a ride with the trigeminal nerve. The sympathetic innervation comes from the superior cervical ganglion and signals travel within the endothelial tissues to the parotid gland preventing the secretion of saliva. Let's move on and look at our next glands. The submandibular and sublingual glands. The submandibular gland lies immediately below the body of the mandible, just anterior to where the body meets the ramus. It is easy to palpate and often easy to see. Its ducts runs anteromedially forwards and towards the midline to the small papilla that lies on the floor of the mouth just behind the central incisor. Remember this happens on both sides of the head even though we're only talking about one at this time. The sublingual gland lies between the tongue and the deep surface of the mandible body. You can't see or feel this gland normally. Instead of a single duct, it has many, 15 to 20 little ductules. If you raise your tongue, the ductules of the right and left submandibular glands can be seen raising folds in the mucosa of the floor of the mouth. These are the sublingual folds. The ductules of the sublingual glands open along the course of the sublingual folds. Both the submandibular and sublingual glands receive their secretor motor supply from the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7. The branches of cranial nerve 7 providing this function are completely different from those we have already met during the muscles of facial expression. This slide shows a simplified version of the pathway. It's slightly more complex than it needs to be as it also shows the sensory fibres travelling to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue as well. These sensory fibres, which are also part of the facial nerve, are carrying taste sensations from the part of the tongue. But today, we are just logging at the secretor motor fibres. We can see in this diagram that the pathway involves the facial nerve. A branch of this nerve, called the corda tympani, the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve, and the submandibular autonomic ganglion, which is where the preganglionic fibres synapse with their postganglionic counterparts. The facial nerve leaves the brain and starts travelling through the temporal bone. Whilst inside the temporal bone, it gives off a branch that travels through the middle ear cavity. Does this sound familiar? This branch is called the corda tympani. The corda tympani carries the preganglionic secretor motor fibres of the facial nerve out of the skull into an area lying medial to the ramus of the mandible. This is called the infratemporal fossa. The corda tympani then joins the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve, V3. The preganglionic fibres hitch a lift in the lingual nerve to reach the submandibular region, which is found just next to the submandibular gland. The preganglionic fibres then synapse with the postganglionic fibres inside the submandibular ganglion. The postganglionic fibres then leave the submandibular ganglion and travel to the submandibular and sublingual glands.
So that's it. We've covered all of the learning objectives we set out to. We have briefly mentioned the minor salivary glands and we've looked in more detail at the major salivary glands. We've also looked at the secretor motor innervation of the parotid and the two submandibular and sublingual glands.